like handsome, by the way, but ugly. You know? <laughs> his, his, and it either goes up or down, one of the way he had a flat nose, you know, like, like a pig or like a, like a like a truck or something like that. And his bulging eyes, they were bulging out so much you could actually kind of look back, you know. <laughs> And it says that he didn't bathe, but in Greek culture at that time, means probably that he didn't show up at the bathing place, which was a whole social thing to, you know, like that and so on. You know? Whatever he had to wear, he was sleeping that at night, just covered himself with it. But he was always just like, you know, what's the word, like John the Baptist, right? Full of the Holy Spirit, looking, everybody he meet would be talking like that. The unexamined life is not worth living. And so he was looking at the marketplace, talking with everybody about these things. <clears throat> so, um, and at that time, a lot, a lot of philosophy and everything else was for prestige, position, how to the future enemies. So he was making a lot of enemies by exposing all these pompous people everywhere like that. He was kind of, and also he was teaching the kids to do the same thing. And they were starting to follow him and everything else, and this was all oh God, you know. Was, he was creating a real, you know, agitation in society and everything else like that. <clears throat> so finally they got these charges, well he's corrupting the youth, he's you know, denying the demigods, okay, yeah, and so on. So then he went to this trial, and, uh, and as I was mentioning, it looked like he was thinking this is an opportunity to get condemned and, you know, and then leave my body and go to heaven. I've had enough of these idiots. And, so he just, right from the beginning, was very antagonistic about the whole thing. He wasn't trying to placate anybody or satisfy anybody. You know? So of course he said, okay, you lose, you're guilty of all these things. But the law was he could leave Athens and never come back, right? And that's what he, that's what he thought he would do. I mean, he thought he got this guy, you know, because either you can take the hemlock, you can die, or else you can leave and never come back. And they were sure, hey, he's just going get, to get out of our hair and be gone like that. We've done this before. But he said, no, you know, if, if I'm guilty of this stuff, then I, I should, I should, I should, I'm guilty of a capital crime. And I should, hey, do, do, just get out of town. No. <laughs> so, so, so he was, hey, now he's going to be causing him more problems, you know, like that, right? Because now he's going to, he's going to bear witness to the, to the whole thing and that Christ and not going to deviate on the truth. You know, he'll get his life, what he's talking about, my God, you know. And people, I've seen that. Professional philosophers criticizing him for, you know, this, you know, actually one of my, my students, he's a professor at one famous university there, like that. He says, it's the problem with, if you're a theologian, is that you cannot live what you, what you, what you, what you know, right? If you actually are a theologian and you actually practice it, people think this guy is not qualified, because he's actually practicing his you know, philosophy. Whereas if you're a physicist, and you say, well, I, I, I've never been in the laboratory. I've never done any experiments. They say, oh, okay. I say, no, 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 you're an idiot. And you've got to, you know, do the work. What's bizarre in theology is that you actually are a theologian and do the work, they reject you. You've got to be somebody who doesn't you know, actually practice what he's talking about. But that was exactly the kind of philosophers that Socrates was criticizing. You know, sophists, right? And hypocrites. So finally, okay, then everything's finished. Now there's one, one, one recourse because the oracle at Delphi can say something, you know, Socrates should live, you know, like that. And then, okay, they had to, the, the sentence had to be adjusted. So they're waiting for the boat to come back from, from Delphi with the annual oracle, and the oracle didn't say anything about Socrates, and so, okay, so now it's time for him to <coughs> either get out or, or take the poison. So the dialogue opens at that place, and he's sending his wife away with the baby and to cry, and then his disciples start to cry, you know. He said, look, I wanted to die in peace, I already sent the women away, and <laughs> all you guys are going to start crying. You know? <laughs> so this is what scholars make this point, that we can look at it analytically, and look at the arguments and the validity and stuff like that, and how it fits into the broader culture and everything else, and how it was the origin of a lot of Western philosophy, how this is our roots, in many ways, in many ways we think uh, because of this dialogue. One professor, he said, all of Western philosophy is just a footnote to Socrates. You know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or else we can, they said, but it's not like that. It's a very emotional, emotionally embedded dialogue like that. So many times Socrates was going to see different religious functions, you know, things like that. He had a whole 
Well, this is my sentiment. And to separate that is actually the word of saying, no, it's, that's a mistake we've made. Now, it has to be integrated with the culture, you know, that he was viewing it as, like that. So anyway, he starts off there, and he basically, one of the arguments says, hey, look, you know, I'm, oh, well, I'm, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy, 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 <laughs> don't cry, you know. Why are you, why you unhappy? I'm going to go live forever with the gods and everything else. You're going to stay here and struggle to make your money and make ends meet and all this stuff, you know. So why? You, know, you should be crying for yourself, not me. <laughs> like that, you know? So, so well, okay, but how can you be so sure there is immortality, Socrates? You know, maybe we all die and stuff like that. It's so better just to hang on as long as you can, like that, you know. And he says, well, he gives various arguments like that which we find in our tradition are the same things, you know. <clears throat> One of the arguments is, he said, well, look at like a, like a musical instrument, right? It's, it's any, uh, or like the, sorry, like the, um, the, 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 there must be a soul because the body is made of gross elements, right? Like that. And so therefore there must be something fine which makes these gross elements produce architecture, music, poetry, honor, prestige. There must be something fine there, like that. Okay. Can I take the poison? Well, hey, what about like a lyre, you know, or a guitar, you know? It's also made of gross elements. Cat gut, there's a gut here. Uh, wood, glue, and out comes this very beautiful fine sound, like that, you know? So maybe it's the same way. The body is made of gross elements and these fine things are coming out. And when they're finished, the body, the soul is finished. And it's a very good argument, and we should not accept blind arguments, you know? But you're forgetting one thing. What's that? The violin maker. Yeah. And the person who's playing the violin. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So whether it's DNA or RNA, whatever, it's almost the same argument. That the gross elements, Zen Giorgi, Nobel laureate, it was maybe one of his, it his acceptance speech or something like that. But he said, as a young man, and was interested in what is life. And many people at that time, in the 1930s and the 40s, were very interested in science to discover what is life, a very heroic view. A whole career studying, investigating, and involving so many other people in investigating what is life. And he said, so now, finally at the end of the investigation, I have nothing but atoms and molecules, which are completely all life whatsoever. He said, somewhere along my journey, life slipped through my fingers. And I have to now retrace my steps and find out where it got away from me. Like so very poignant. And many people like that, actually, in science. They came to this conclusion that this pathway is going to go back. You know, like and, and look at it. We use the tools, but look at it a different way. So that's the argument that Socrates, and we're saying it basically is his same argument whether you're talking about DNA, RNA, that the mature combination of gross material elements will only produce gross material things, like that. And it has to be something fine to produce these higher things. Um, another argument is, have you ever seen perfect beauty? Have you ever heard perfect truth? Okay, which is what I'm talking about. That's the argument. So he says, therefore, we must have existed someplace before where we experienced these things. And we can always look at the, look at the comparison and say, no, still, some blemishes, some vanity in the argument like that. So another argument then is, is that the, and he, he says, and I think this is a whole, whole focus in one article I'm seeing on this one phrase, uh, there is a very ancient doctrine which says all living souls come from dead souls and all dead souls come from living souls you know so reincarnation like that. but he says there's a very ancient doctrine so there's a whole area i think there's a whole paper on this investigating how it goes in different traditions like that it's a whole you know whole area actually this this is new i mean the, the, the tools we had to investigate this in the 1960s aren't the same tools we have now the archaeological discoveries that we have now are much more profound. The access to different cultures is much more profound. And so it's a whole new adventure going back and looking at this now than it was in the 1960s. 
So that's his point. But yeah, the second argument is that there must have been an existence where we, where we thought of these things. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, he says, if there is no God, where from this idea is coming? <laughs> yeah, same, same argument. You know, that there must be, you know, the argument itself, you know, the, the idea itself, which he calls the forms, Socrates, leads us to exist, understand there must be a permanent existence. There must be a reality there, otherwise where is the idea going to come from? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think there are many arguments he gives. And then finally he goes through some cosmology, which some Western people, I'd say, just rejected completely, but have a suspicion that if you look at the, uh, the Vedic cosmologies, you're going to find, you know, the quintessence, the fifth elements, you're going to find, like, some similarities there, like that. But the thing is that by the time it got to Socrates and it got to Greece, it was probably very confused. You know, animal sacrifices are recommended in the Vedas. Buddha stopped them because people didn't know how to do them. They're recommended in, 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 in Judaic tradition, but they were stopped also. But before, the description is they worked. People knew what they were doing. And everybody was happy when the person was sacrificed, human sacrifice was immediately done. They, they lost this ghost body and achieved a celestial body or something like that. But, you know, people didn't know how to do this anymore, and so on. So, the cosmology he discusses, he discusses these arguments. And finally he says, okay, <laughs> are, you, are you convinced? Like that. So the disciples are looking at each other and, you know, Socrates, you know, in your presence, nobody, you know, can have an, a logical argument, you know, to defeat you about these things, you know, like that. So according to all logic and reason, yeah, there is another life after this. And how we enjoy or suffer depends on whether we're good people, honest people, and like that, you know. And therefore it's better to live, to sacrifice everything for the truth and, and the justice and beauty, yeah, like that, because in the end, yeah, you're going to get a, a higher reward. You know? But, we're just like little children who, when, you know, your mother shows you, you go to your, your, your aunt's house and you're staying in a strange bed and your mother shows you there's no monsters under the bed, there's no monsters in the closet. <laughs> But she goes out and closes the door, and you're alone there, and you hear, <laughs> so you pull the covers over you. <laughs> the monsters can't get me. You know? Is it just like that? That there's no logical reason to be afraid, but still, Socrates, were afraid. And when everything is finished, the soul just evaporates. It's so better to hang on at any cost you know, to this life. So his conclusion, as I'm remembering now, I'll read this more detail, he says, that, yes, it's a fact. You cannot establish, this was also Newton, I just for this reason, but it's rising Newton, it's the same point. I'm going to finish here now. Uh, Newton was a theologian. He actually, Newton discovered the laws of gravity, the laws of mechanics, the laws of uh, optics, he just, you know, invented calculus, so many things. He did all this between the ages of 18 and 22 years old, like that, genius, you know. Before that he was studying theology. He was studying the Bible, the commentaries. After that he was doing it. Why, 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 why did he deviate? According to his opinion, he didn't deviate. He said there are two books for understanding God. The Bible and nature, where God is writing with his own hand. And that's what he was looking for. And he found that, yeah, this is obvious, he talks about a super celestial being does all these things. Okay, so let me go back and look for him in the Bible. But he said, Principia, his principle, his major work, I hope that it will inspire people because of the logic and everything else to go towards divine life, but you can't establish it by reason and argument in these tools. You know, it has to come from revelation, descending, and inspiring you to go up. You know. So same way, Socrates' conclusion is, yeah, but all these reasons and arguments, in the end, they can give us some perspective, but in the end, you have to apply the word of the soothsayer daily. Every day, hear from the self-realized soul, like that, who's already seen the truth. And they're not, there are quite a few of those in Attica and the surrounding countries like that. So this conclusion is that we can go through this thing, but beyond that, you have to find somebody who's actually experienced it. And by hearing it, discussing, talking, you know, then you can actually also experience it like that. So it's kind of a, our 
introduction to this great adventure right, of East-West dialogue. And this, the, the beginning, this is also a series of dialogues. And the very first one I get a chance to get into it here. Beautiful dialogue between uh, Sutta Goswami, uh, the sage, and the sage of the Nayamishranya. And the beginning, again, this is the beginning. So basically, all he, he's talking about God as at Hoksaja, that that spiritual principle which is inconceivable by the gross senses. Again, he's starting off like a, for those who just come out into the light, doesn't want to scare them by talking about personal relationships. You can't understand. So he does talks about the beginning also in a very intellectual sense like that. You know, and the importance, the importance of the, of the investigation, right? And so Buddha, same thing. And Buddha said this is the most important question, right? The famous story of the poisoned arrow. You know, yeah, the important thing is to first become immortal. And so Christ, everybody, this is the beginning, is this is the, the the unexamined life is not worth living. That's the apology. So we, we, we all agree that without the philosophical principle, it's all useless. And so, on. And so therefore, all the modern education should. Actually, our, our, the head of our university, um, that's me now, <laughs> okay. uh, Ivan Rodriguez. He's uh, our university, Ricardo Palma, he's the, the uh, was called rector down there. But he's also uh, president of the Association of Rectors for All the Universities in Peru, professor of law. Uh, he, his, his, his idea, he's finding, it's a fight, you know. He said, well, the university should produce first is human beings. Second, technicians, like that. Not our whole thing is to produce technicians who kind of get the humanity tossed in like that. A few electives you got to finish it off, you know. The focus of the university should produce, produce human beings. And then, then they can learn technology and stuff like that. So that's why in South America it's easier, yeah? To, to approach these things sometime, different countries like that. So that's kind of our, our introduction you know, to the ABC, XYZ, and DEF, and like that. Today, special discount prices, <laughs> only half price, two thirds off, like that. <clears throat> How much is Bhagavad Gita? Ten dollars. Okay, not twenty, <laughs> this is This is actually a bit in quantity, right? Only five. Five dollars, I'm told. Yeah, it's actually the large quantity. And then the uh, Krishna book? It's fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So any questions then? Questions, complaints, comments? Uh, I have a comment. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I remember, oh gosh, go back maybe 40 years or so in my life, that I ran in San Francisco the Cultural Integration Fellowship. Ah. You've heard of it, right? We get it the Cultural Integration Fellowship. No, I think it's a different fellowship. I think it's the one okay. in the more. <laughs> okay. This was based uh, the, uh, on Sri um, Shri Aurobindo. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there was a Stanford professor yeah. who got that going. And uh, then Dr. Harida Chaudhry came over and and I used to go there quite often on Sundays yeah, yeah, yeah. and they had uh, uh, gurus like you yeah. giving a lecture, different yeah. ones, and Dr. Chaudhry had a fantastic sense of humor. Uh -huh. uh, so, but unfortunately, he's no longer around, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah they, sound. but the, the Cotton Integration Fellowship is still there, it's just north of the uh, Golden Gate Park. Yeah, I remember, because actually there was from, from uh, Sri Aurobindo, okay. Because also, um, Aurobindo is Bengali? Aurobindo is Bengali. Yeah, and also the other one is uh, Dr. Autobiography of Yogi. Oh. Paramahansa Yogi. 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 Yogi Nanda, Because we're also Bengali. It's just like, again, different countries, so Bengalis are all, actually one person told me Bengalis are the French people of India. Okay. Yeah, very, very good, you know, intellectual. Actually, Aurobindo uh, created an ashram in the in the French part of India. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Pondicherry. Yeah. Yeah. Pondicherry. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah Bengal, Bengalis, very, very philosophical people. Punjabis, very down to earth, hardworking farmers. They like kids with big feet. <laughs> 
president of India is a Bengali now. Huh? The president of India is a Bengali now. Ah, uh -huh. okay. So, Pranam Mukherjee, Bengali Prime what Bengal is thinking today, the rest of India will think tomorrow. <laughs> but I have people, they go to, go to uh, Calcutta now, and they're, they're, they're three, 3G, three 4G, four th four they don't work. <laughs> but they say, they told me, they said, but I've suddenly I've discovered I have a family. <laughs> they told me, my, all my high tech stopped working, so I discovered, oh, I have a daughter. <laughs> She's five years old. So maybe that's the future. Yeah. Hang up yourself when it's talking about it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell the question? Can you say that I said by logic and argument we cannot reach the absolute truth? So, uh, similarly, by logic and argument, people cannot uh, define it. Yeah, I think this is by, by logic, by logic and argument, we also cannot defy the existence of the absolute truth. So, where does the logic and argument supposed to lead to? There's a very good, uh, you know, Ken Wilber, our, our hero, called Quantum Questions, very good book, you know, nice book. But it's an anthology of you know, thoughts on these matters, philosophical matters, by the great founders of modern physics. So he has several citations from Arthur Eddington who was considered Einstein, Einstein's closest friend, so many ways like that, and also a scientist in his own right. So he said, people now ask me if, if science is in a position to prove the existence of God. And he said, proof is a deity, the proof, is a, the proof is a deity before whom the pure mathematicians torture themselves. <laughs> Physicists and science, physicists are using satisfy the sacrifice before the lesser altar of probability. <laughs> so that's, that's science. You know, the science, again, they, they themselves admit, you know, you can't prove anything. You, know, you can establish probabilities. The you know, students t-test. The chances of this coming out by chance are one in a hundred. Okay, let's investigate that. The chances of this happening by, this happens, the event happening by chance is data is one in a thousand. Okay, we prove it. But, but no, it's not a proof, but it's just, you know, there's the whole things in epistemology we can get into about the limits of you know, ascending, pro the, the descending process. But that, that's the whole point. The point is that, again, it gives an, an indication that this is a pretty reasonable way to, you know, to invent, to go like that. You know, like that. So, Bahunam Bhagavad Gita, Bahunam Jamanam Mante, Ganamam Mam Prabhajante. After many lifetimes of cultivating wisdom, and we're here now because we've been cultivating it before, yeah, then finally you come to this conclusion that yes, there has to be a controlling feature behind everything. You know, like that. You know, it's not only, it's not like not having my chance. So that's the idea that by the, the mature fruit of, of analytical process and everything else is to come to this conclusion of, of looking for the mystical plat platform. In, in introspection, one comment was it uh, was his name, Pauli? He was considered the most analytical of the Nobel laureates, very hard-headed guy. But another, somebody else was commenting that he followed this pathway very rigorously to the conclusion, and his conclusion was that there are thought processes that exist before the analytical level. And of course, in my background in psychology and everything else, we just, that's yeah, it's obvious. You take study of psychology. We, we do not see, you know, the, the world. You know, we, we do process it tremendously. You know, we reproduce a whole image of what's happening like that. And different people, because of different psychological perspectives, traditions, they see a different world. Not just like they see a different world. You know, like that. And you go beyond that into motivation, and then that's, you know, the most fundamental thing we're saying. Is, why? Is it because of egotism or is it because of generosity? So logic and argument are very good to take us to the point of finding the introspective life. But at that point, then they just you use them as you need them.
like for example, we see two objects randomly colliding in space. So, yeah. so how, how do we explain this in terms of the design of Okay, so he's asking, there's one argument, the argument from design. That's the what you're talking about. There's an argument from design, which is, okay, this, I think about Socrates also the same thing, that this must have been designed or created by an intelligent designer. There's so many, and actually, people, I mean, from our side, even there's uh, nature's IQ, there's actually more and more investigation, deeper and deeper investigation into the sophistication of the world like that, you know? And, and how the argument from design is that you see more and more. I've heard this William Stoger. He's a, he was a, he's a Catholic priest, but also he's an internationally published astrophysicist. But he's giving this, you know, showing this, the, the argument from design and how it works. But yeah, you see so much organization, therefore there must be a designer like that. So, so that's the argument. So the next point is that how do we reconcile this with random events like that, right? Yeah, but Apparently random events. But that's that okay. So what is a random event? What is chance? Okay, back in the back we're gonna have some. I'd like to ask if um, you you know I'm, I'm a newcomer to this. It, it, do you follow like in the Abrahamic religions that God is uh, a he? Uh -huh. Or is it an androgynous thing, or is it a personality at all? I mean, do we ascribe a, a, a sort of a human-like personality to this mm -hmm. this entity, or is it uh, completely androgynous? Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the person who started yeah. the clock going and then sat back and watched what was happening. Okay, so we're going to deal with random events. We'll come to that next. <laughs> if you look at like a, a book on statistics, statistics one a, a random event is an event, the outcome of which cannot be predicted. It says nothing. <laughs> yeah. All it says is that a, a random event is an event that we're absolutely sure we know nothing about. Now in Sanskrit this is called neti neti. It's not this, it's not that, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this. Euclid's first definition of a point Everything is based in Euclid's system, which we use. And we have the chairs are arranged by Euclidean geometry, the room, our lives, our thoughts. This is how we think. I know, it's a machine. I understand it now. Yeah. yeah. It's all coming from Euclidean geometry. But what is his first principle? Which we call God in most cultures. Okay. The point. What is a point? Holiness. Huh? Holiness. X-Y. The point is that which has no extension. It has no X, it has no Y, it has no Z, it has no mother, it has no father, it has no name, it has no past, it has no future. Not this, not this. Well, maybe it has a color, it has no color. <laughs> what is it? You know, this is in Sanskrit, it's one of the philosophical approach called eliminating everything. You know, like that, you know. So then, you know, it's, it's Bertram Russell, he said the most, in, most important concept of the 20th century is the idea of chance because no one has the slightest idea what it means. <laughs> they start pushing, pushing people on this, and they start, oh, chaps event, random event, you know? But then, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that this we, we, we try to, you know, more, we, it, for example, a random number generator. Algorithms to generate random numbers. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but then they discovered that the algorithm they did actually breaks down in certain conditions and cause a cause a, uh, an imperfection, a microchip of the flying airplanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Call it, you know, crash the airplane. You know. yeah. So this is the first point that, we, that even, like, even was it that Einstein's, Heisenberg's not certain principle, Einstein's comment was, I don't believe the good Lord played the dice for the universe. You simply, you simply are lazy headed to not to find out what the cause is. It's an excuse for being lazy headed. So that's our point is that we would actually challenge the our tradition actually challenge the idea of you know the random event. You know, like that. Yeah. But there are they, they, no there are no random events. Everything is everything's being controlled, there's different ways of being controlled. And 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 yeah, okay, but okay, then it comes to the point of free will, right? right. Yeah. So these things are very big philosophical discussions like that. So yeah, that our, our point would be that in this model and everything else, that we, we're very suspicious of random events. 
and you start to get into them, they, they can be explained like that. Okay. okay, now God is an androgynous <laughs> hermaphroditic entity. Um, in the, our tradition, again, which we're talking about, is what we are specifically the Brahma, Madhava, Gaudiya, Sampraya, we're Indian philosophical tradition, and we're specifically coming through Bengal, you know, through Sri Tetri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, somebody else is going through, you know, uh, Karl Marx and Engels. You know. And our, our, as far as we're concerned, yeah, we go back to, to the origin of everything. And uh, we, our perspective is monotheistic, right? That behind everything there is God, okay? And that masculine and feminine principles are eternal. They're not something that disappears when you go to a certain level. And, but, but at that level, they become delightful. At that level, the battle of the sexes is fun, rather than this world causing divorce and suffering. So yeah, there's, there is. There's masculine and feminine natures. And yeah, they, they both exist. They both have their different natures. And, that, and that's why you see them in this world. But then they're all delightful. And God, God is the cause of all causes. Our basic definition is God is the cause of all causes. Like that. If you look at the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, by whom all things are created. Then yeah. you say Father. Huh? You said Father, which is... No, I, I said the Nicene Creed says Father. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Too. We have a hard time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but do, do you, you know, in, 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 in the in the church, in the Christian church, we say he all the time. We yeah. don't say she. You know, it's always he. I think in, also in the Muslim uh, tradition yeah. as well. Solomon. And also in the Judaic tradition, it's yeah. always he. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm sort of, it always makes me rather uh, squirm a little bit. I can't yeah. think of it. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, no, we, uh, our tradition is, yeah, is that God, okay, is by himself, for himself, you know, everything. But, then he has eternal, eternally manifest potencies, you know, which are considered to be feminine, like that. But they're not different to him, you know. But yeah, and the, the terminology and the language we use, we use he for God and she, she for, for, the, for the Shakti, like that. But it's, you know, but they can't be separated. It's just like a light, a light bulb. The, the God, God has no meaning without, without his feminine aspect. There's no meaning to God. You know, we're God without without the feminine aspect like that. You know, so on. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's, it's a very subtle point. We discussed this much earlier that the, 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 the conjugal love of God is accepted in many traditions as the highest form of not highest form of worship. So then, then we're talking about a very subtle form of conjugal relationship. Then. So it's a very interesting discussion. Okay. We can continue the discussion. Yeah. Uh, we are um, very, very much grateful for Anubhav yeah. <laughs> Swami. And for the Bhakti Yoga Club of Stanford University and Pacific Learning Alliance that has sponsored this and these, these series of events. Can you all hear me? Yes. I usually, usually no one has trouble hearing me even without the microphone. <laughs> I don't know, is this working? Yes. Okay. So we do have um, a, as promised, a vegetarian meal, which will be served outside, and then you can bring it back inside and continue our discussions or have pro more private discussions with Swamiji. And also, please peruse these books. Today. Actually, there is a special discount. Oh, the Krishna. This one uh, on the side. This is the this is the summary study of the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which tells the whole story of the life of Lord Krishna five thousand years ago. And uh, this month, in honor of Krishna's birthday, which is coming up, uh, we really are moving these Krishna books, so we have to sell them out. So. Uh, Whatever donation you can, we, you know, we try to get 15, we try to get 15, but it's an honor system, if you only have 10, it's a sliding scale, if you only have 5, we, we're letting them go. 
but uh, but hurry up because they're not going to last long. Yeah. We have a um, we have a, um, a questionnaire that we ask you to fill out. Um, many of you I notice uh, a lot of my old friends from some of the other programs have been here before. Uh, please fill out these questions as it helps us decide. Um, you know, what kind of programs to put on at Stanford and what other kind of speakers to invite and so forth. And uh, also helps us stay in touch with you so that we can invite you for the next programs. And uh, finally, uh, do stick around. Uh, Swamiji is here for as long as you uh, like and uh, and, uh, and enjoy the vegetarian uh, meal. Thank you all very much.